Bo'chotabot, ladies, and welcome to another edition of our weekly Torah classes. And whether you're logging on to Torah anytime or to our incredible Torah site for women, ohelsara.com, or if you're a YouTube subscriber and follower, it's so incredible how every single week you tune in and you listen so devotingly to Hashem's words. And I am certain that you're drawing whatever inspiration you can from these lectures. And of course, during this auspicious time of the year, it is even more incumbent upon us to, to, to listen to Shiurim and to draw inspiration so that we could enter into the new year, Rosh Hashanah, with de more dedication with a deeper understanding of who we are and what we want to accomplish in life. Um, I do want to dedicate this shiur to Simantov Moshe HaKohen Ben, Arava Shalom Ben Tamara. HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give his neshama in aliyah and give the family tremendous comfort through this year of mourning. We are just three weeks away from the great and awesome day of Rosh Hashanah, the new year on the Jewish calendar. This is the day where the Creator sits in judgment over the entire world. This is the day we crown God as the King of all that was ever fashioned. Rosh Hashanah is the precursor to the 10 days of repentance, the Aseret Yemei Teshuvah, to an accounting of our deeds, both good and not so good, of our midot, our characteristic traits, of all our mistakes and iniquities, and what we could do this year to adjust, to repair, and to enhance. The prayer book that we use during the Yamim Anuraim, during the High Holiday Service, is called a Machzo. If you'll open up the machzo, there's one word that you'll see that constantly comes up. That word is emet, truth. It actually appears three times in one single pasuk in the unique beracha, the unique blessing in the middle of the Rosh Hashanah, tefillah of Amida. What do we say over there? V'taher libenu, purify our hearts. Le'avdecha be'emet, to serve you, God, in truth. Ki ata elokim emet, for you are a God of truth. Udvarcha malkenu emet, and your word, our King, is truth. Vekayam la'ad, and it is established forever. This seemingly simple word, emet, appears again and again and even with more force in the haunting prayer of Unetane Tokef that was written by the Holy Rabbi Amnon of Mainz in the 11th century. In the beginning of this tefillah, we reference Hashem's infinite power and our uncertain destiny. And one of the psukim that we recite is the following. Ve'yikon bechesed kis'echa, your throne will be firmed with kindness. Ve'teshev alav be'emet, and you will sit upon it in truth. Emet, it is true. Ki atahu dayan, that you alone, God, are the judge. Umochiach, and you prove. Ve'yodea va'ed, and you know, and you bear witness. These references of emet make us wonder why we're being called upon to recognize the truth and why this calling is so particularly significant during this time of year. Because no matter what we're searching for this year, whatever questions and needs we might have, an important part of our journey is truth. It's emet. Truth creates 
a place of clarity, of understanding and acceptance in our very busy lives. Truth is the place where the hardest questions we have about ourselves and our life are made more clear. It helps us to consider where we are on the path of living a life of purpose. Jews are meant to be doshe emet. We are the seekers of truth. As Jews, as seekers, we never reach the end of exploration. We're constantly searching, learning, and questioning, and hopefully we'll, we're, we're, we're never feeling fully settled until we've come to the place of the ultimate truth. As a matter of fact, the word emet, is, and by the way, I would really um, recommend that anybody who's logging on to this shi'ul should actually, so it should be a visual experience for you because it's going to be, might be a little uh, more difficult to understand as we progress to the shiur because there will be a lot of numbers that we're going to talk about and letters. But anyway, as you see the word emet, which is spelled aleph, mem, taf. These letters are at the beginning, the middle, and the end of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. Mem actually comes in the center of all the 22 letters, and Taf is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So this word, emet, encompasses the entirety of the extent of Judaism. The Torah is emet, and our lives are meant to be lived through the eyes of emet. In Judaism, truth is at the core of everything that flows in the mystery of life. Rabban Gamliel, alav shalom in Pirkei Avot says, Al shlosha dvarim ha'olam omed. The world stands and is upheld by three things. Al haddin, on justice. Al ha'emet, on the truth. Ve al ha'shalom, and on peace. So Rabban Gamliel is offering us three values that each of them, in a sense, are equally powerful. And if, we, if we'd remove just one of them, it, it'll be like taking off one leg from a three-legged table. The result would be an unstable and unsecure table that could very easily collapse. Which means that a world with only justice and peace, with only din, Right? And, uh, and shalom, but without truth, that third leg, is a world doomed to destruction. The Gemara of Shabbat says, Chotmo shel HaKadosh Baruch Hu emet, the seal of the Holy One, blessed be He, is the truth. And David HaMelech Alav HaShalom in his Sefer Teilim says, Emet me'eretz titzmach, Truth from the earth shall sprout forth. And the Baal Shem Tov, Alav Shalom, explains what that means. He says that God cast truth down to this earth, and sadly, that truth is being trampled upon. So our main objective is to unearth the emet that needs to be revealed, because there is no creation no creature in the world that's actually separated from that truth because the king's seal is emet and everything he created has the spiritual DNA of that truth. That's the secret behind the words in Megillat Esther that state the following. Kichtav asher nichtav b'shem ha-melech for a writ written in the king's name and is sealed with the king's ring, it cannot be rescinded. Kabbalistically speaking, everything in this world contains the seal of emet, of God's truth, and therefore it can never be uprooted, altered, redesigned, or reformed. But this pursuit of truth, sadly, is very different today, ladies. 
There's a world of, of information out there literally at our fingertips and the notion of truth is slightly skewed and not so clear because anything I want to be true can be true if I search for it hard enough. That means that the entire meaning of truth, reality, and fact is merely a distortion of the ultimate truth. So whether we like it or not, we have to understand that, that, that this distortion, what it does is it places us in, in, in a safe little bubble of what I call comfortable truths, where the reality is altered, where facts are amended, and it's becoming more difficult to get out of that bubble. Which means the search for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth is the very identity of the Jewish people and what we have to continue to seek. It means that we have to demand of ourselves that we ask the right questions. We have to ask ourselves, am I living a life of integrity, honesty, and completeness aligned with what I know to be true in accordance with Hashem's Torah? Do I live according to the values set forth by God? And am I in constant search of where these values truly come from? Do I realize that the truth is rooted only in the Torah? Am I guiding myself or is the truth guiding me? Is someone else's bias leading me, or is God's truth directing me? Am I truly pursuing the truth, or am I constantly running away from it, hiding behind fallacies and dichotomies, claiming that I'm an honest and truthful person? Where is the truth, and where am I really? Is there a far distance between us? Am I afraid to approach it? Do I recognize it when it touches me very deeply? Or do I push it away and create an alternate reality and call that the truth? Is there really such a thing as my truth and someone else's truth? Or is there one truth but perhaps two views? two perspectives, two biases, two prejudices. And am I willing to accept the real truth, even if that truth hurts? Am I prejudiced with that truth? Am I only truthful with some people, but not with others? Do I call an untruthful statement a kindness because I'm afraid of the reality? And if kindness is my truth, am I kind with everybody? Or do I only use the truth when it's convenient for me? When it suits my life? Am I willing to accept the truth and understand that ultimately it's going to change my life in a meaningful way and that it will heal me and even redeem me? Can I accept that? Am I truly a Doresh Emet? Am I a genuine pursuer of the truth? I've got to ask these questions. Sifre Musar teach that each of us has various characteristic traits. Like we have patience, humility, courage, gratitude, and more. But Chachamim also teach that most of us are slightly out of balance. Even though each trait is connected to the others, one of the most central traits, Chachamim say, is emit, truth. If we're not honest with ourselves and with each other, we'll never correct those imbalances. All we'll do is end up manipulating and restructuring the truth because we're afraid of that very thing that can finally set us free. So we think thoughts like, um, 
Maybe I won't get that job that I wanted if I'm, if I'm truthful. Maybe my neighbors won't like me if I actually speak the truth. Maybe they'll judge me if I'll say an honest statement. Maybe they'll look at me in a negative light if I oppose their sheker, their dishonesty. Maybe the truth means the end of something and the beginning of something else. Maybe my truth will be damaging. Those are the things that sometimes go through our minds when we think about the possibility of truth. I, I have to say that when we're truly honest with ourselves and with others, you know what we're really doing? We're confronting the underlying fears which get in our way and usually Usually, the truth is very redeeming and it strengthens us, it strengthens our character, it strengthens our neshama, our soul. As a matter of fact, the famous Rabbanim, Hillel and Shammai, Alayim HaShalom, asked in the Gemara of Ketuvot, Keitzad merakdim lifnei hakala? How does one dance before a bride? There's a big discussion in the Gemara about this, but one of the underlying meanings is actually about truthfulness. The Rabbanim are asking, what do you say to a bride who's not beautiful? Shammai, Allah Shalom taught, we do not lie, ever. So what do we do? What do we do? I mean, do we tell her she's not beautiful? He says, no. Instead of commenting on her beauty, we search until we find something else that is true and positive about her. And if you can't find something, try harder. But the point is we don't lie. The point is we don't lie. Similarly, not all truths are true just because we say they are. Right? You could say, but, but that's the truth. Yeah, you say that's the truth, but that doesn't mean it is the truth. The Torah teaches us to actually question our biases, our opinions, our prejudices when we're trying to seek the truth, when we're trying to seek true honesty. And we should especially avoid distorting the truth for personal gain, for personal satisfaction and contentment. That's why in a Sefer, Mesilat Yesharim, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, Alam Shalom, known as the Ramchal, tells us that lying is a spiritual illness and it could cause us to lose contact with our own being, with our own neshama. So on Rosh Hashanah, we consider the truth of our lives and how we've lived it this past year. This is the time where we don't look at our life only through our own eyes, but through the eyes of Torah. Hillel Alav Shalom teaches that we are not the singular judges of the truth. The truth might just lie with somebody else or something else. Having said that, the Rabbanim of yesteryear who compiled our prayers understood the dichotomies of man in this dual world. The ancient world, just as the current modern world, was not free from biases, from lies, from selfishness and tyranny. Governments and people were always busy pursuing their own self-interest and many did what they wished without truth leading the way. So our Torah is a powerful call to be mindful of the ultimate reality of the eternal values of truth and integrity, and to remember always the everlasting God before, before whom all human beings pass in true and ultimate judgment. Hashem and His Torah are emet, and to abandon that truth is to abandon true freedom. In 1938, the Chancellor of Austria, Kurt Schaschnig, I'm, hope, I'm hoping I pronounced his name correctly. Schusnig, something like that. Schusnig, I guess. 
He met Hitler, he machshem of and, and he thought he'd be able to dispute the lies that he knew he was about to hear from, from, uh, from the Fuhrer, from Hitler. But the barrage of falsehoods came pouring down and he found himself helplessly unable to contradict any of Hitler's words, if you could believe that. That just goes to show you. Sometimes, when you have a multitude of people around you barraging you with their truth, it can convince you of falsehood. You understand that deep statement? Their truth might actually be a falsehood and you believe it to be true because they're barraging you with it. With it. But anyway, and in our day and age, by the way, it feels as though we're once again living in a world filled with fake truths, false facts, and self-serving untruths. So, lying seems to have shed its shame. A person could actually look you in the eye and say, this is the truth, and it's not. A person could actually say about himself, I am a very truthful person. No, you're not. No, you're not. No, you're not. And, and again, it, one has to look into his own life and the things that he has done that contradicts his own state of truth. But that's why the Machzor of Rosh Hashanah calls out to us quite strongly and urges us to come home to the truth. The truth in our own hearts and the truth of Hashem. Being a Doresh Amet is a Jew's perspective on life. We are truth seekers and we have been since the beginning of time. We're the one nation in the world whose, tr whose truth has been non-negotiable and enduring. And what that means in the context of Rosh Hashanah is that our deeds actually matter. Our deeds have an impact on those around us and on the world itself. That is the truth. We cannot evade the consequences of our words, of our actions, and therefore we're always accountable before one another and before the Ribbono Shel Olam. We can't hide because the truth at some point or another will come out. Who we are really will one day become known. Now that doesn't mean, by the way, that truth is your enemy. No. It doesn't mean that that's something, truth is something that we need to avoid at all costs, like little children trying to avoid getting caught when we've stolen the cookie that we, our mother said we can't have before supper. No. Truth is our ally. Truth is our friend. And met demands that we be honest with ourselves, deep within ourselves, in our hearts. It requires us to cleanse our conscience and mind. It directs us on the path of honesty and integrity. It teaches us to be just and trustworthy in all our relationships and dealings in life. And the truth is also very humbling. It makes us mindful of the, the greater picture of life, of humanity, of this world of which we're but a tiny, yet very significant part of. So Rosh Hashanah calls out to us to embrace the truth as we stand before the God of truth, whose word is truth. Emet is a powerful word and it's a formidable tool. I don't even think we realize the depth and the weight that this word carries. The Midrash actually comments in a pasuk in Sefer Teilim that states, Rosh devarecha emet. The beginning of your word, God, is truth. David HaMelech is saying that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu began his Torah, he began with a signature. What does that mean? The Gemara of Ketubot states that when Hashem signs a heavenly document, so to speak, He signs His name as Emet, truth. What do we say? Vadonai Elokim Emet, God is truth. So when Hashem wrote the Torah, He signed His name from the very beginning 
almost like an artist that if you look at the bottom right corner of the painting, you'd see the signature. And the signature of the creation of the world is emet, it's truth. And the Midrash asks, well, where do you see the word emet in the beginning of the Torah? Well, I'll show you. If we take the Sofei Tevot, which are the final letters of the first three words of the Torah, which is Bereshit, Bara Elohim, right? You take just the, what, what is Bereshit Bara Elohim? In the beginning of God creating the heavens and the earth, right? Of God's creation. We see the Sofei Tevot are the letters Taf, Aleph, right? And Mem. So the Sofei Tevot of Bereshit Bara Elohim form the word emet, which means truth. Therefore, Hashem placed His signature right at the beginning of creation. Right at the beginning of creation. But guess what? There's more. If we look at the end of creation, after the six days were created and HaKadosh Baruch Hu finally rested, what does the Pasuk say? Asher bara Elohim la'asot. Hashem rested from all the work that he did. And if we look once again at the last letters of the words, bara elokim la'asot, we see an aleph, a mem, mem sofit, right? And a taf. Once again, we see that these words spell, inadvertently, the word emet, the word truth. So what does that show me? And you. That Hashem placed His name and seal at the beginning of creation and at the end of creation, and His seal is emet. And Rabbi Yonasan Eibshitz, Allah Shalom, explained this idea on a much deeper level. He actually asks a question that many of us have thought about at one point or another in our life. The question is, why did Hashem begin the Torah with the letter Bet, Bereshit? which is actually the second letter of the alphabet, instead of using the letter Aleph, which is the first letter of the word Emet, truth, and also the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. That would make more sense. Hashem could do anything that He wants, right? So why didn't He begin the Torah with the words Elohim bara Bereshit? Elohim begins with the letter Aleph. And that would open the Torah with an Aleph and not a Bet, right? So. Some Mepharshim explained that the Torah actually did begin with the letter Aleph because in actuality the Torah was really initiated when God gave the Jewish people, Am Yisrael, the Aseret, the Aseret Hadibot, the Ten Commandments at Har Sinai, at Mount Sinai. And the Ten Commandments begin with the words, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am Hashem your God. The word Anochi begins with the letter Aleph. Oh, so there's your Aleph. There's your Aleph. Now that's a wonderful answer. I like it. But it's kind of like a drash. Like you kind of have to go like this. A question still remains. Why not start the Torah with an Aleph from the very beginning? Why do I have to go now to Tsefer Shemot to where the, the Torah is being given over there, Parashat Torah, uh, to get my Aleph over there? Let's just start the Torah with an Aleph. Why does the Torah start with the letter Bet? Why does Hashem skip the Aleph and begin the Torah with the letter Bet? Bereshit. Why? Rabbi Yonatan Ipshit says something incredible, which requires a little mathematics, but I know you guys out there, you're, you're Baruch Hashem, very smart. So take out your pens and papers if you already haven't. And let's look at the word emet, which we had up here before. Let me just get it. Hold on a second. Oh, here it is. Which is comprised, right, of the aleph, the mem, and the taf. In numerical value, in gematria, this word emet equals 441. Simple mathematics. The taf is, sorry, the taf, <laughs> the taf is 400. The mem is 40, that's 440. And the aleph is one, that's 441. And in mispar katan, 
which means if we would add those digits together, 441, where we do a 4 plus 4 plus 1, in Mispah Katan we get a smaller number. That smaller number would be 9. Right? That's the magical number of emet. The magical number of truth is 9. Anytime we see the number 9, we need to hold on to it because that's the number of emet, of truth, as opposed to the opposite of truth, which is sheker. Sheker is falsehood. Let's take a look at that word. The word sheker is spelled with a shin, a kof, and resh. In gematria, that equals 600. 300 is the shin, kof is 100, that's 400, resh is 200, that makes it 600. And in mispar katan, a 6 plus 0 plus 0, right, 600, equals what? Equals 6. So the number 6 represents sheker, represents falsehood. So 9 is the number of emet, 6 is the number of sheker, and very interestingly, if you flip them around, they become the same thing. That teaches us a lot of things. It means you can change truth into falsehood, and, 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 and you can actually take falsehood and make it the truth. Yeah, it's, a, it's just an interesting observation. But anyway, now, if you'd start counting here we go, here we go with the math. If you would start counting from the letter Aleph, which is one, and you would count three digits, so you would add, well, let's do it this way, okay, so you see only this. If you would add an Aleph plus a Bet plus a Gimel, which means you're adding one plus two plus three, that equals six. Oh wait, <laughs> we don't like that number. We don't like that number, right? So let's forget about one plus two plus three. Let's move on to the next set, which is what? Dalit, right? Dalit, hey, vav. That would be four, five, six. Let's do that one. Dalit, hey, vav, four plus five plus six equals 15. And one plus five equals six. Again, here we have that. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. So let's try the next three letters. Ooh. Let's try the Zayn, Chet, and Tet. Let's try seven plus eight plus nine, which equals 24. But then we've got two plus four is six again. And if you continue, right? Let's take the, the next three. Yud, Chaf, and Lamed, a 10. A 20 and a 30 equals 60. So there's the 6 again. And if you continue through the entire alphabet like this, if you would begin with the letter Aleph going three digits, you get the number 6. And that means it's not a good idea to begin counting from the letter Aleph, from the number 1. So Yonatan Apeshit says, well, what if we begin counting from the letter Bet, the number 2, in the same three-digit pattern. Let's do the same exact experiment, but this time we're going to begin with the letter bet, right? We're going to take bet plus gimel plus dalid. Two plus three plus four. That equals nine. Oh, that's interesting because nine represents emet. So let's continue. Let's continue. Let's do the next three. Hey, vav, and zayn, right? Hey vav zayn. Hey vav zayn. That equals 18. 5 plus 6 plus 7 is equal to 18. And 1 and 8 is equal to 9. Oh, we have emet again. We have the truth. Let's move on to the next series of letters. We've got the chet tet yud. We've got 8 plus 9 plus 10, which equals 27. 2 plus 7 is 9 again. Oh, that's interesting. Let's take the next three. Chaf, Lamed, Mem. Chaf, Lamed, Mem equals 90. 9 plus 0 is 9. There's that number again. If you do that calculation throughout the entire alphabet, you will always get the number 9. 
So Rabbi Yonatan Apeshitz does this experiment that's proven, and you could do this forever. You could go down the whole entire digits, right? And continue onward. When you begin with the letter Aleph, if you start with the number one in this three-digit series, you will always get the number of Shekir, of falsehood, which is the number six. Whereas if you begin with the letter Bet, you will always arrive at the number of Emet, the number nine. So when Hashem wrote the Torah, He specifically chose not to open the Torah with the letter Aleph, because if we begin with the letter Aleph, with the number one, we arrive at Sheker. So David HaMelech says, Rosh Devarecha Emet. God, your Torah began with the letter that represents Emet. You wanted it to choose, you wanted to choose Bet as the letter, because when we begin counting from the number two, we'll always come to the number nine, the number that represents Emet, the number that represents truth. I'm going to tell you something else that's fascinating about the number nine. <coughs> Get ready for this one. Take out your pad and pen. If you multiply the gematria of your name times nine, the total will always be the number of truth, the number of amen. For example, I'll give you an example. My name, I have two names, is Kineret Sara. Kineret in gematria, in numerical value, is 670. 670 times 9 equals 6,030. If we add the digits in 6,030, 6 plus 0 plus 3 plus 0 equals 9. Oh, very interesting. What about the name Sarah in my name? Sarah is equal to 505 in gematria. If I times 505 by 9, the number of truth, it will equal 4,545. 4 plus 5 is 9, plus 4 is 13, plus 5 is 18, and 1 and 8 is 9. Ladies, you could do this to any one of your names. Hopefully you spell it properly, okay? Any Hebrew name, or any name if you're spelling it properly in the, in the Hebrew language, times nine, times the truth, will always lead you back to the truth, which means when there is truth to begin with, it always leads you back to the place of truth. It doesn't matter how long your name is, it doesn't matter what your name is, if you attach a nine to your name, if you assign truth to your name, it will always bring you back to the number nine, to the number of truth, emet. And what that tells me is that every person's spiritual DNA is somehow connected to the emet, to the truth which is really inside of us. That means that God's entire creation has his seal and the imprint of Emmet. And if we attach ourselves to the truth, to the source of truth, which is Hashem, the Emmet will always find its way back to us. Rabbi Mansour tells a, a story about a student who approached him after a, a lecture and he said, Rabbi, you always say that the Torah is Emmet, the Torah is the truth. How are you so sure of that? I mean, uh, uh, there's numerous books in the library that tell us about truth and values and ethics. I mean, did you ever read Emily Post's book of etiquette? In it, she actually tells you what's right and what's wrong. She tells you what's considered ethical and what's considered unethical. She tells you what's considered proper conduct and what's considered improper conduct. Rabbi. Now I have to say, I know that Emily Post uh, is not uh, the authority on the laws of Shabbat or Yom Tov or the laws of uh, Kiddushin. Now I'm not saying we should trust her word on those uh, very lofty topics, but why can't we trust her to give us the proper code of ethics and values? She is, after all, an authority figure on this great subject. And she sold millions of copies of this book. 
So why are you telling us that ethics and values can only emanate from the Torah because the Torah is the emet? Why not use the book of etiquette? That was this man's question. Before we even address this guy's question, you should know that I'm so happy that here at Ohel Sarah, our starting point and our ending point is the Torah. Because Rabbi Mansur is right. Only the Torah contains the truth. Sadly, today there's a, a new phenomenon that's taking place that we're not all aware of. This isn't something that existed when we were young, but it's called relativism. Not to be confused with the theory of relativity, right? Relativiz relativism has nothing to do with the theory of relativity. Relativism means that when I speak and use a particular word, that word has to be explained in the context that I'm saying it relative to other things. For example, if I'll say, this man over here is very rich. Well, that's a relative terminology because who am I comparing that man to? If I'm comparing him to a pauper, yeah, he's definitely very rich. But if I'm going to compare him to Bill Gates, he might not look so rich anymore. It's a relative terminology. If I say, this boy is the smartest boy in the class, that's relative because I don't know who the other boys in the class are. If the class we're talking about is a Harvard class, oh, that's a compliment, right? But if it's a class where the children are very, you know, uh, educationally challenged, then that compliment of being smart is relative. But today's society has taken things that are not really subject to a relative interpretation <coughs> because there are certain things, by the way, that are absolute, like one plus one equals two. That's absolute. That's not relative to anything. This stender over here, this stender that I use every week, it's made of wood, real wood. You hear that? It's made of real wood. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the stender. It's not relative to anything. It's a fact. It's absolute. But today, everybody has their own relative truth. The truth means whatever you want it to mean and whatever's comfortable for you. And therefore, we're, we're being forced to respect everyone's interpretation of how they define something that used to be an absolute and what used to be genuine concepts and now they say things like well we don't see it that way so imagine somebody approaches me after this lecture right um, and they come over to me and they say Rabbanit I want you to know that I took offense when in your lecture you said that your stender is made of wood because I believe that it's made of glass. It's glass. It's not wood. Now, in the olden days, folks, if somebody said something like that, we'd probably ask them for their mother's name and put them on the Tehillim list and pray that they should have a refuah shelema, a speedy recovery. The point is that if a person claims that this stender over here is made of glass, we would consider him a misken, a poor guy, poor guy. But today you're not allowed to say that he's, a, uh, he's mistaken. You can't say that. You have to say, well, uh, let's agree to disagree. We have to be politically correct. We have to, we have to say things like, you know, uh, fine, you look at the stender and you see glass, and I respect that. But I look at the stender and I see wood. So let's agree to disagree. So notice what happened over here, folks. Notice what happened. We took something that's an absolute 
and we turned it now into relativism. It's now become relative to the way you see it. Therefore, there's no truth anymore. Everybody has their own interpretation of the truth. I'll give you a, 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 an example of how off the edge we've gone with this. Not too long ago, there was a certain case in, uh, in a New York hospital where a woman was uh, giving birth over there. And when the baby was born, the doctor, who I guess was naive and didn't know about the crazy concept of relativism, turned to this mother and he said, congratulations, it's a baby boy. <laughs> you know, I'd be happy if you told me that. You'd probably be happy if the doctor announced this. That mother became extremely agitated, horrified, looked at the doctor and said, I'm offended. How dare you decide for this child that he's a boy? We are going to wait until this baby grows up to decide what it wants to be. Now, I have to be very honest with you. I mean, when I was young, a boy was a boy and a girl was a girl. I mean, uh, I mean there are telltale signs for this kind of thing. You, you could just figure it out. You don't have to be a genius to figure out a person's gender. It's very obvious. It's not relative. I am not a girl relative to someone else. That's something that is a fact. That's an emit. That is a truth. I don't need to compare myself to other people to know who I am. I am a woman. I'm proud to be a woman and I take pride in my femininity. But today, you have to let the person decide what he is because it's a very personal matter. It has nothing to do with the truth of how you were created. Today we have to be very careful not to chas v'shalom offend anybody. So if you're on a college campus and you see your classmate approaching, you say, uh, you know what? I just want to tell you, you're a very nice person. You have to say that because you don't want, you don't want to commit to, to, what the, the, to what they really are, right? Someone actually did that, by the way, and he, got, he still got into trouble. He was on a college campus, you know, he saw a classmate, he was about to approach the classmate, but his other friend who saw that stopped him and he says, listen, be careful how you're going to talk to this guy. You don't want to commit to what he really is because you know that guy has his own relative truth and he, he decided what he wants to be, so don't, don't refer to his gender. The guy's very sensitive about that. So he says, oh wow, thank you for telling me because I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. So he walked up to that classmate and he says, hey, how you doing? I just wanted you know, to thank you for the notes that you gave me at the end of the class that I missed. You're a really very nice person, thank you. Well, that guy got so upset. He said to him, nice person? I'm a giraffe. Well, the other guy was shocked. He says, oh, I didn't know that, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you consider yourself a giraffe. I'm really so sorry. I was so caught up, uh, whether you're a boy or a girl, I didn't even think about the giraffe part. And the guy says, yes, because I look at myself as an animal, I consider myself a giraffe, and I would appreciate it if you'd respect that and accept that. So the guy says, okay, listen, you know, you wanna, you're a giraffe, no problem. Could we take a picture so I could tell my kids I was at the zoo? Could I pet you? <laughs> I don't know what happened after that, but <laughs> so now th listen to what happens here. Something that's an absolute becomes questionable. That's what's happening in today's society. There is a complete breakdown and a decimation of the truth. There are no more absolutes. And that's why Ohel Sara and organizations like this are so important because what we're doing is we're giving you the truth we're telling you God's truth 
We're giving you the ability to access the book that is not subject to political correctness, that's not subject to bias or to prejudice. And as you know, we have a campaign, a Rosh Hashanah campaign, where every year, the beginning of the year, we collect for the, the, the few months of the year so that we can continue to do our good work. There's so many things that we do here between the Shabbatons that we have for teenagers, the weekly Torah sessions, the private classes, the tutoring programs. We just opened up two more branches now. Um, every single week we have a shiurim taking place at Amid Nashia for young girls, or say young girls over the age of between 18 and 25, who have not yet uh, come close to Hashem and we're helping them get closer to the truth. We have a program for little boys in Natanya Bezat Hashem that we're collecting money for so that they have uh, an occupation, something to do after school since here in Eretz Yisrael they end school so early. There's so many things that we're doing. Rosh Chodesh events, uh, private classes that we give, tutoring programs, weekly shirim for women, Shabbatons, you name it and we're doing it. We cannot survive alone. We need your help. So please, please, <laughs> throughout this entire month of Elul and part of Tishrei, we are campaigning that you should please, please make your generous donations for the coming few months that we should be able to survive these months. Bezat Hashem uh, and with the help of Hashem. And I give you a bracha that the donation that you give, you should see it coming back to you not in funds, but in protection, in prosperity in life, in true happiness in your life, in your relationships with people, that your children should be protected, that you should have always with, see Hashem with clarity, that you should feel that you're always blessed. Be'ezat Hashem. Please, please log on to www.olsara.com. Click on the donate button and please show me your support. Thank you so very much. Let's just continue. Um, yeah, but we need to access that book that's not subject to political correctness, that's not subject to bias or prejudice, because the only entity in the world that's not subject to any of these, these things is God and the Torah. Everyone else who's going to provide you with an ethical opinion, including Emily Post, that opinion is subjective. Subjective means that it's biased on their personal opinions and prejudices. And that means that you're not going to get a real, pure opinion of right and wrong. As a matter of fact, those opinions are liable to change over time. But something that's emet, something that's the truth, the truth doesn't waver. The truth does not change. One plus one will always equal two. It equaled two 2,000 years ago and, equ and it'll equal two in 2,000 years from now. That's something that's an absolute. Whereas the Code of Ethics that Emily Post wrote, her book was revised 10 times already and she died in 1960 and they're still revising it because what was considered wrong or unethical in one generation now became correct and ethical in the next generation. So synthetic man-made laws and opinions, they fluctuate based on political and societal pressures. I'll give you another example of this. When the United States of America was founded in 1776, it was established by the founding fathers of America who were religious men with Judeo-Christian values. There was actually a movement by Thomas Jefferson to make the official language of America Hebrew, the biblical tongue. Could you imagine? They wanted Hebrew, the language of the original Bible, to be the official language. These were men of faith who used the Bible as their guide. So the original founding fathers were religious people who believed in the sanctity of life. In those days, if somebody took the life of an unborn child, it was considered a federal crime punishable by death. And nobody questioned that. They understood that this was one of the commandments. 
לא תרצח, thou shalt not murder. But years later, as society assumed that they're actually advancing and becoming more sophisticated, because society always thinks that they're evolving and becoming better people, although we know that that's not always true. But as society evolved, they produced more lethal weapons and various ways to kill people. So society doesn't always develop in a more progressive and healthy way. Nevertheless, nine judges in Washington, the Supreme Court justices, you would think if nine people who represent the emet, right, the nine is the magical number, if this sitting trying to conjure the emet, you would think that actually get to that place of emet. So these nine judges, they put on their, their, their black robes and they assume that that provides them, of course, with additional wisdom. And they began to ponder and scratch their heads, contemplating over a question that actually is not a legal question, rather a philosophical one. Anyway, they sat there and they said, let's take a vote. First of all, who agrees that you should not murder? And it was nine to nothing on that one. It was unanimous. We don't murder. Okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, we can address the second question. When does life begin? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Oh, we never thought about that one. <laughs> you know, now, 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 there's no law book that deals with this question in America. So this is strictly based on opinion. You have nine people who decide for 300 million people based on their vote of the nine, which is a very narrow vote, they're the ones who decide when life begins. And after they consider the answer, which they mull over for a few days, thinking that they're, most, they're the most experienced people to even address that question since they, they're, they're wearing those black robes and because uh, they have tenure for life, they assume they can't make a terrible and grievous error. And they now decide that life begins outside the womb. And even if they don't all agree, if the majority takes the vote, then that becomes the law of the land. So if they decided that life begins outside the womb, they don't really care what you do as long as the baby doesn't emerge from the womb. Once he emerges, oh, that's when you're going to have issues. So they just created a new definition that the world hadn't heard for over 2,000 years. Life begins outside the womb. The point is that something that we thought was absolute, or rather should have been absolute, when we allow human beings to have a say, for whatever their bias is, and it's clear what their bias is, those judges were being influenced by many things by political pressure, by societal pressures, but notice what happened. They were very crafty and they were very clever. They did not redefine what murder is because remember they agreed that murder is a crime. What did they do instead? They redefined what life is. Obviously if you redefine life, it's going to affect how you define murder. Now let's assume we accept this. Is it case closed? No, obviously not, because it didn't end there. A case came before the Supreme Court concerning an elderly woman who was in the hospital, I think on a feeding tube, and the doctors presented their case to the judges and they said, your honors, this woman is not gonna make it. So we wanna stop the feeding tube. We wanna pull the plug. And obviously her children were against that idea. And they were telling the judges, what do you mean? What do you mean you want to stop feeding her? You can't do that. This is our mother. 
So the doctors, uh, their side was, yes, she's your mother, but she's not going to pull through anyway. So we want to stop the feeding tube. But if you stop feeding her, she's going to die of starvation. And anyway, they went back and forth with the judges, yes, no, yes, no. And the judges now had a huge dilemma because they already decided that life begins outside the womb. And this old woman was outside the womb already for 95 years. So they didn't know what to do. They're thinking, hmm, what are we going to do over here? We've got a serious problem here because she's outside the womb already. We can't put her back in the womb. Although if we kind of try to push her back in the womb, maybe we could try to kill her. That wouldn't be a problem. The problem is that she's outside the womb already. So how could we kill her? Listen, we're going to have to figure out a way. We're going to figure out a way. You know what? Let's go back to our discussion about life. Life must be defined by quality. After all, what is life? Life is about the quality of life. A quality life means that you could eat, you could sleep, you could dance, you could hit a tennis ball, you could visit a movie theater. All of these demonstrate the quality of life. So let's apply our new definition of life to this case. Can this woman eat? No. Can she walk? No. Could she play golf? No. Okay, could she swing a tennis racket? Also no. She can't do any of these things, so she really doesn't have quality of life. And according to our new definition, if she has no quality of life, she has no life. So they ruled in favor of the hospital and allowed the doctors to pull the plug on this old woman. That's what happens when you allow human beings to start playing around with values. And we shouldn't think it's over. It's not over by a long shot. They'll continue to digress, to sink, and to fall lower and lower. You cannot rely on synthetic values because synthetic values are going to change from time to time. They're taking things that aren't subject to relativism or shouldn't even be subject to change and they are redefining the absolutes. But we know that ethics, values, and morality, we know that it must come from God. He's our source. And Hashem's book is emet. It's the ultimate truth. That's where we go to for our answers. And that truth is going to teach you the proper values and guidelines according to God's definitions. And I'm going to give you an example. Think of when we were young children in bed at night. Quite often our parents used to read us books before we went to sleep. I don't know why they read us those crazy fairy tales instead of reading us stories about Tzaddikim, about the righteous. But anyway, <coughs> one night a mother read the story of Robin Hood to her five-year-old son. Now for those of you who are not familiar with the story of Robin Hood, uh, just to give you a, a quickie uh, a summary, Robin Hood pretty much used to rob from the rich in order to feed the poor. And uh, the story that the mother read explained how the rich people were wealthy and how it wasn't right that they had all this money while the poor people had nothing. So Robin Hood wanted to settle the score. He'd go out in the middle of the night to rob from the rich in order to provide for the poor. Now, obviously, as that little five-year-old boy grows older, he realizes what most of us realized, that this was a story meant to indoctrinate young minds into socialism. Because Robin Hood was pretty much a communist, if you think about it. But put that on the side for a moment. When we were young, for whatever reason, we looked at Robin Hood as a hero. Because he stole from the wealthy who anyway 
wouldn't feel the hole in their pockets and he did a great kindness with the poor. And since the rich weren't dramatically affected by the robbery and the poor would now have something to eat, it was a one-win situation. So Robin Hood, was a, Robin Hood was a hero. But let's plug Robin Hood into our Torah. According to the Torah, Robin Hood is considered a full-fledged felon. He is a ganav. He's a thief. Does the Torah allow us to steal from the wealthy in order to provide for the poor? Absolutely not. But if we'd allow human beings to decide, you know what they would say? They'd say, of course stealing is wrong. But if you're doing it to divide wealth evenly, that's not called stealing. That's called equality. What happened here? What happened? You know what happened? We changed the terminologies and played around a little bit with the semantics and we can now begin to legalize the worst crimes. I want to conclude with one more example. Many Syrian Jews from Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York, they make their way to Deal, Deal, New Jersey for the summer. Now, at some point, the Deal Township came out with a, a journal celebrating its 100th year anniversary. Uh, 100 years, by the way, is not long for a town. But anyway, anyone who uh, lived in the town received one of these journals in the mail. One of the rabbis was looking through this journal, and it was nice to see you know, what the town looked like uh, 100 years ago, what the police station looked like, what the streets in different places looked like 100 years ago. It was nice, cute. So this rabbi thought, you know, this would, this would make a good topic for a lecture. So he took the journal, and we brought it uh, to, the, to the shul, and that was the topic of his Shabbat uh, lecture. He stood up, he looked at the con con congregation, and he said, Ladies and gentlemen, I read this journal from cover to cover, and the most exciting part of the journal was on page 153. And all the congregants were, they didn't remember what was on page 153. So he turns to page 153, and it was a picture, and underneath it, it read, man and a woman walking to Phillips Beach on a Sunday. So all of a sudden, one of the congregants, you know, yelled out, Rabbi, that's your favorite picture in the book? That this is even inappropriate for a rabbi to look at? Such pictures of, of, of men and women going to the beach on a Sunday afternoon in the summer? I mean, we thought you'd get excited from the picture of the old synagogue. And you're kind of showing us this picture? And the rabbi said, no, 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 no. I'm going to show you the picture. You're not seeing the picture properly. And the picture was amazing. Because in it, you saw a man wearing shorts past his knees. Socks covering his knee and closed toe shoes. He had a hat on. He was wearing a long sleeves buttoned down shirt. And for some reason he was carrying an umbrella. This man was standing next to his wife who was wearing a long house dress, fully covered, you know, down to her wrists, below her knees, she was wearing stockings, closed toe shoes. She was wearing a bonnet and carrying a pocketbook. These two people were going to the beach. So the rabbi told his congregants, when you look at this picture, you realize that it could have read, it really could have read, Man and woman on the way to call Nidre on Yom Kippurim. And I would have been happy to see that. 
<laughs> the rabbi said. As a matter of fact, I'd be very happy if people would come to shul today the way the goyim used to dress to go to the beach a hundred years ago. Because what was also written in the capture underneath that picture was that if you didn't come dressed to the beach appropriately and modestly, you received a fine for indecent exposure. This is the way the Gentiles behaved just a hundred years ago. That's what the rabbi told his congregation. So what happened? We allowed society to provide the rules and code of modesty. A society that keeps veering to the left, veering to falsehood, and to a selfish bias. But more than that, today's society is doing whatever it can to eradicate the truth, to disconnect itself with God and with his emit. Many people are still struggling between what's right versus what's wrong, between truth and falsehood. So how does a person decipher between these two? There's one way to achieve this. Donate all Sarah.com. <laughs> that's one of the ways to make sure that you're a promoter of truth, and that's what we're doing. Donate so we can continue to promote the truth. That's jokingly. I'm not joking, you really should donate, but there's one way to achieve this, to be able to decipher between emet and sheker. Bereshit bara elokim. Rosh devarecha emet. You have to go back to emet. You have to go back to the book of truth, to the number nine that represents emet. If it's emet, it has to be present at the beginning, the middle, and the end. Because truth doesn't change, ever. It starts the truth, it continues to be the truth, and it will end as truth. And that means from 100 years ago, to 100 years from now, to the present, to the future, our emet does not change. It doesn't lend itself to relativism. Our emet is absolute. So this year, my dear friends, we have to be committed to the emet. Moshe emet, v'torato emet. And we should thank Hashem, asher b'char banu, that He chose the Jewish people, mikol ha'amim, from among all the nations of the world, v'natan lanu, and that He gave to us what? Torat emet, the Torah of the only truth in the world. Our Torah is not a synthetic Emily Post book of etiquette that changes as the wind blows and is modified and reprinted 10 different times and probably is going to be reprinted another 10 times. Our Torah began with a singular emet and continues forth with that emet for all time. So let us recommit ourselves to our holy Torah to the emet of the Torah and to the teachings of that truth. You should know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu puts certain people in certain places at certain points in history. And it most likely has to do with things that are beyond our comprehension with Gilgulei Neshamot, you know, reincarnations and all kinds of rectifications, tikkunim. You know, your presence whether it's the YouTube followers, the Ohel Sara followers, the Torah Anytime followers, the people who come here on a bi-weekly basis, your support and what we do here, which is to reinstate true values and emit into the hearts and minds and souls of people, that is a huge merit of yours. You're helping me to restore the Tselem Elohim, the image of God to our fellow brothers and sisters. How fortunate are we to be supporters of God's truth? And the fact that God placed you in such a position, and the fact that He calls upon you to assist, where you have a chalik, you have a portion of saving somebody's soul. Do you know how that's measured in Shamaim? The Mishnah in Sanhedrin says, Lefichach nivra adam yachidi. 
For this reason man was created singular and alone. Why? Lelamedcha, to teach you. Shekol ha-me'abed nefesh achat me'israel. That if a person allows but one soul among Am Yisrael to be lost, if you destroy one soul, ma'ale alav ha-katuv, strict scripture says concerning him, ki'ilu ibed olam male. It's as though he has destroyed and lost an entire world. Vechol ha mekayem nefesh achat me Israel. And he who sustains or saves even one singular soul among Am Israel, ma'ale alava katuv, scripture says concerning him, ki ilu kiem olam male. It's as though he has sustained and maintained the entire world. And we're involved. In saving the world, you and I, a hundred times over every single day. Because we deal with so many people. Not just one. So, I want to thank you for being a part of our beautiful organization. And for those who are watching who come here on a weekly basis, bi-weekly basis also, that you're part of this beautiful home for helping me create a foundation of truth for everyone. Hiratzon, may it be Hashem's will that we should be zeicher, we should merit to be seekers of truth, to be doshe emet. We should be zeicher to recognize the emet and to embrace it, to live it, and pay it forward. May that truth lead us to a safe place, a faithful place, and bezat Hashem, it should redeem us with Mashiach tzitkenu. Amen ken. Hiratzon.